lesson number 11 in this particular set. That's not fair. Well, normally, you know, I, I do have a habit of going and defining things in the lesson, but I, I'm just kind of go over that. I don't, need, I don't think I need to do that this morning. I think, I, I think we all have a pretty good understanding of that's not fair. I think we can, we can all uh, understand that. There may, may be no sentiment expressed more frequently on earth than the claim, that's not fair. There's an exclamation point there, so you have to say it like that. That's not fair. <clears throat> I think everyone should be able to relate to this phrase. It's unlikely that any one of us have, have never had a similar thought pass through our minds at some time or another. What is and isn't fair is a very common thought in this fallen world. But I have news for you. When used in the context of this lesson, this thought will only... <clears throat> Excuse me, this thought will only ever be placed in our minds by the enemy of our souls. When we consider the shame Jesus experienced and the torture and separation from God that he faced on our behalf, that is not fair. But for someone to have more than us or to be treated better than us is something that the enemy of our souls will use in order to try to destroy us. When we really think about it, Satan really doesn't have much to work with. He only has the visible world, this visible world that we live in, and its contents. And we know that, all of, that one day, all of these things will be gone. And our souls will live eternally somewhere. We're assured of that fact. Our souls are eternal. <clears throat> but for some reason, we have a tendency as humans to listen to the very one who desires our destruction. We have a predisposition to placing more weight on the things that are temporary than on those things which are eternal. Jeremiah 29, 11 for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith God, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, in this particular situation, it would be another 70 years before God's people would be freed from captivity at the time that this was spoken to them. <clears throat> but even then, God had already set his plan in motion, which would lead to their eternal benefit. They didn't see the freedom ahead of them. They weren't experiencing it at that point. They were too busy wallowing in their own self-pity. After all, that's not fair, is a selfish cry for the things which God already knows will not truly benefit us. If the things we thought we needed would really benefit us, as God would have us to be benefited, we would already have them. They would already be a part of our possession. But God knows the thoughts that he thinks toward us as well. He didn't just, this wasn't just these thoughts that he thinks towards the people of Israel weren't just for the time of Jeremiah. He knows the thoughts that he thinks towards each one of us as individuals. And he is working toward our eternal future. <clears throat> if, we will take, if we will take our eyes off the here and now long enough to see that God really does care, we would never again fall victim to the enemy when he tries to cause us to believe that we have been treated unfairly in this life. Jesus himself spoke a parable that related to fairness. In Matthew 20, an owner of a vineyard hired workers at five different hours of the day. Some workers came early in the morning, probably around 6 a.m., while others were hired at 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and 5 p.m. Now, this was a 12-hour workday starting, starting at sunrise and going till sunset, so that just gives you a time frame of what, what's expected of the workers here. 
Jesus continued his discourse on this odd parable that leaves us at times scratching our heads about this seemingly bold act of unfairness on the part of the vineyard owner. As Jesus continued his story, he related to his disciples that the owner of the vineyard called his workers to come to be paid in reverse order from the time they were hired. In other words, the vineyard owner paid those hired at 5 p.m., before he paid those who had been hired very early in the morning. And to make matters worse, Jesus finished the parable by stating that they made the same wages regardless of the time spent working in the vineyard. When those men who had worked the entire time were paid, they naturally complained of unfair and discriminatory treatment because, of course, they had witnessed the amount which the workers who had who were hired last, had been paid. Excuse me. Now I want to point out right here, before we go any further, that the first workers who were hired agreed on their own wages. They agreed. They had, they had dealt with the vineyard owner and said, yeah, that's what we'll do. That sounds like a fair price. As the owner hired the others, he simply promised to pay them what was right. They had no idea what they were getting paid. They just knew that they were going to get paid something. They understood that their net wages were not set, but the householder was going to pay them nonetheless. Whatever he chose to pay them would be more than they would have made standing around idle. So they were happy to receive whatever it was that they were going to receive. They, the day laborers of this time were paid on the day that they worked. According to the law, they were to receive their wages before the sun was set. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, just in my own personal reading, I just try to read through the Bible. Uh, I happen to be reading this very passage last night in my personal reading time. I found that very uh, interesting that God would allow that to fall in right there. But they had to be paid before the sun was set this way they could take care of their families. This is totally a foreign concept to us today. We have no idea what it means to be paid on a daily basis. Many are now paid at the end of the week. Uh, others are paid every two weeks. And some are only paid once a month. So this concept of being paid on a daily basis is very, very foreign. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, what did he say? He said, give us this day our daily bread. We often gloss over this fact when we read the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> but Jesus was telling us, we have no promise of tomorrow. So there is no point in praying for anything more than this day's needs. We, we're guaranteed right now. That's the only thing we're guaranteed. We're not guaranteed that all of us are going to walk out those doors at noon. We've got no guarantees. Right now is the only guarantee we have. And so Jesus tells us to pray. Lord, give us this day, right now, what I need right now. Lord, give me what I need right now to keep me where I need to be, to focus on you, to serve you as you would have me to. Give us this day our daily bread. Not tomorrow or next month's food, but today's, right now. This was a part of the sin of the rich man who planned to tear down his barns and build bigger. Jesus told what the rich man said in Luke uh, 12 and 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. <clears throat> Now, in this situation, he was not looking to God for his daily needs. He wasn't, first off, he wasn't praying to God. He was talking to himself. He was bragging to himself, basically. He wasn't telling God, oh, I thank you, Lord, for supplying my needs for years to come. He's saying, you've done pretty good for yourself. You know, you, you've done the right thing. You, you've hired the right people, and you've planted the right way, and you've done everything right, and now, because you've done everything, 
you're getting blessed for it. I'm so good, I deserve everything I have coming to me because I've got this whole pile of food stored up for me for years to come. <clears throat> he was not looking to God for his daily needs, but he was looking to the great store which he thought had come by his own power. Many may have looked at the, his great wealth and, and his enormous store of food that he had and cried out, that's not fair. Look at all this food he has. I've got to work every day just to get by. And he's got all this food stored up. He's, got, he's having to tear down his barns so he can make, uh, his, I can imagine his servants thinking, thinking this. He's got to tear down his barns. I'm going to have to tear down his barns so I can build bigger ones just to store all the stuff he has. And I've got, I've got to deal with what I can scrounge around on today. I, I, can't, I can't sit back and relax and, 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 re, and, and just eat what I got sitting. I've got, I've got to work every day. That's not fair. Well, I've got to, I got to, I got to wonder, um, who now would desire to trade places with him in the pits of hell? What would be the benefit? Why? Why do we have that tendency to look on the immediate benefit that others we think have and fail to recognize the end of the situation? Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 31, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Paul agreed in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 9, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And we see this is exactly what happened to the rich man who, who was getting ready to tear down his barns. We know the end of the story. We know that God came to him and told him that very night, thou fool, what, what benefit is all this? Who's going to receive this benefit that you've stored up? Because this night, your soul is required of you. This night. He had all that stuff and it had absolutely no benefit for him because he died that very night that he spoke those words. He didn't get to enjoy, so he didn't get to sit back and enjoy all that store that he had. And those servants who are crying, that's not fair, all of a sudden, Lord willing, they, they had a better understanding of the situation. Lord willing, they saw what it was, the benefit that they had in trusting in God for their daily needs rather than trusting in themselves for their bank account, for their insurance, for their retirement, for their IRA, whatever it is. When we trust in God, we don't only have the assurance of today's needs being filled, but we have also the assurance of our eternal needs being filled. And to me, that's, that's a far greater value than knowing that I've got $100,000, a million dollars in my bank account. It's, it's better knowledge to me than knowing that my house is paid off, my car is paid off, these things that I know are going to one day disappear are fully in my control. We have to keep our eyes focused on God for our daily needs. If we will do that, He will supply us. We're assured <clears throat> of that fact, but according to Paul, we run the risk of being considered rich if we have anything more than food and clothing. Uh, we've talked about this before. We, we all have a place to live. The majority of us have a, have a vehicle to drive, or if we don't have a vehicle to drive, we have people to take us somewhere somehow or another. Uh, we Public transportation, one way or another, we're able to get around. So according to Paul and Jesus, we run the risk of allowing the enemy to convince us that we're rich and trust in what we have rather than who we serve. If we allow what we have or lack physically 
to determine our choices, we may need to recenter ourselves on what God's will is for our lives. We are promised food and clothing in this life if we follow God. Anything beyond these necessities has at least the potential to drag us into the same destruction as the rich man Jesus described in his parable. If our eyes are firmly fixed on God, we will have no issues with those who seem to have better lives than ourselves. It's only when we look at those around us that we see that others may have more of this world's goods than we do. Is that really a benefit? Is it really a benefit for us to look around ourselves and say, well, the pastor, boy, he's got it set. He's, he's so much better off than I am. I, I can't believe God would treat him so good and, and treat me so poorly. Is that going to benefit us? Is, is that going to help us in our spiritual walk? Is that, going, is that going to cause us to be sensitive to the Spirit when the Spirit is moving through the pastor that we're looking, ah, oh, he's, he's so special. And I don't think any of us have those thoughts concerning our pastor. Uh, uh, we, uh, we see the accounts. We see the, the money that he makes at this church, and it's, it's nothing, nothing that great. But we have that potential to look around at other people, whoever it may be. Our bosses are, are those in, in uh, uh, families that we may know of in or out of the church. If we, have a, if we continue to allow the enemy to focus on what others have that may be more than us, we're only causing ourselves pain. We're only causing ourselves destruction and despair. We're only leading our, listening to the enemy of our souls and ignoring the God who has taken care of us up until this very point in our lives. Yes. When I was working at the banner, I got a, a new, new reporter on the staff and he, uh, he started telling people what he was making. And uh, so he told my assistant, my assistant was making less. And uh, so she started going around to everybody finding out what they were making. She felt like she wasn't being treated fair. She did not know that I had already gone to the uh, publisher and asked for a raise for her. Mm -hmm. But she went around and, and she stirred up all this problem because they felt like they were not being treated fairly. Yeah. And uh, as a result, she got reprimanded. She finally did get her raise, but she was reprimanded for what she was doing. And uh, the young man who had started it all, mm -hmm. he got off scot-free. <laughs> but that was the whole thing of it. She felt like she was being treated unfairly. She was comparing it to everybody mm -hmm. else there. But we, we have to be very careful when we look around us and believe that we're being un treated unfairly. That's, that's the way we, we uh, <laughs> talking about getting off scot-free. As it is, in that situation, so often it is in our own lives. We'll, we'll allow others to destroy us. And they, most of the time, they have no understanding that they've done anything. They have no understanding that they've caused the slightest of problems. Is that, was that really a benefit in that situation for her to know those things? Was, is it really a benefit in our own situation when, when we see those who may have more than us and focus on those facts? Does it benefit us? How will those things that we desire in this world draw us closer to God? Will that happen? Will it happen that we draw closer to God by focusing on, on our perceived lack because of others' perceived benefits of the things of this world? Will that benefit us spiritually? Will they not rather draw us further from the God we claim to serve? If this is the case, how are we benefited by looking around us and seeing what others may or may not have or seem to have? <clears throat> the 6 a.m. workers, supposing they should make more because of their longer work day, were naturally disappointed when they received the same wages as those hired at the last hour of the day. 
the early morning workers persisted that they were ill-treated since they had worked in the hot sun and throughout the day. The owner explained that he had paid the workers exactly what he had told them they would be paid. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> No, no. They were given exactly they were, what they exactly. They had agreed on their wages. The householder was good to his word in giving what he had promised. He had given them exactly what he promised. He had given them exactly what they'd agreed upon. The Bible says that they agreed on a penny for 12 hours work. Now, the Greek word here for penny indicates uh, Roman denarius and that coin would have had the buying power equal to between 80 and 120 dollars today. Just, just this would have been sufficient <clears throat> for the care of their families. But they were not satisfied with enough. They wanted more. Their eyes were not focused on God, but on the wages of the laborers who had worked fewer hours. God had provided them the ability to work. He had supplied them with a job. He had given them a faithful boss who had paid him just as he promised. Uh, we read, we talk, uh, we hear about how there are some who, and James, I think it is, talks about those who worked and, and the laborers who reaped their fields. Uh, the, the one who <clears throat> should have paid them was holding back their wages. This wasn't one of those. He was faithful right then and there to pay them according to the law when he was supposed to before the setting of the sun. But all of this was overshadowed by their perceived underpayment. They'd gotten what they'd agreed on. Do we allow God's blessings to go unnoticed or ignored when things don't work out exactly the way we want them to? <clears throat> Or do we give glory to God for what we have rather than complain to Him for what we lack? We have these examples as a reminder to look at what we have and rejoice. Ecclesiastes 1, 14 and 15, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Yet how many times do we try to count all that we are lacking rather than praising God for all that we have been given? None of us have gone hungry. None of us are without clothing. We have all been blessed beyond what, according to the word, any of us deserve. We don't have any right. We don't have, any, we don't have the authority to complain about anything that we don't have. We've been given life. We've been given breath. We've been given the opportunity. Each and every one of us have been given the opportunity to wake up this morning, and regardless of our physical situation, we were given the ability to get into church, to get here this morning. Not all of us are the same at the same level of health physically. But each and every one of us were able to get here this morning. Now, I, <clears throat> I don't envy anybody who doesn't have allergies. <laughs> I wish I didn't have them. <laughs> but me envying someone without allergies is not going to benefit me. It's not going to help me spiritually. It's not going to help me physically. As long as I'm focusing on the negative... I, we're not, I'm not even talking spiritually. As long as I'm focusing on the negative, it's been scientifically proven if we focus on what's negative, we're going to feel bad. And if we focus on what's positive, we're going to feel better. <clears throat> how, much more, how much more better are we going to feel if we're not just relying on positive thinking to get us through the day, but we're relying on the God who has supplied us every single one of our needs up until this very moment in our lives. I've often said, has God ever failed you? <coughs> Have you ever failed God? No matter how many times we as individuals may have failed God, He's not once failed us. 
in the midst of, of my sinful life, when I, when I didn't deserve the least of God's blessings, God allowed me to survive. If he didn't allow anything else, he allowed me to survive and make it through the, the stupidest mistakes I'd ever made in my life so that one day I could come to know him because he knew the thoughts that he was thinking toward me even when I wasn't thinking about him at all, even when I was denying him. He was still concerned for my well-being. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the parable, the owner of the vineyard raised the question why they were murmuring because of his kindness to his workers. He confronted them with a question why his kindness to those workers was a problem for them. Golden Truth, Matthew 22, <clears throat> 37 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus explains fairness. These two commandments have a formula for fruitful life. Christ also paraphrased the second commandment with this positive statement. As ye would as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. However you want to be treated, that's how you need to treat other people. If you don't like the way you're being treated, don't treat other people that way. If you like the way you're being treated, make sure that the next time you treat someone, that's how you treat them. <clears throat> there is no doubt Jesus wanted these disciples to get past their own selfish desires and ambitions. He desired that they would confront their selfish motivations while he was with them to try to sort things out. They needed to search themselves for their inner motivations in following him. Jesus was testing them to see what their response would be. 1 Corinthians 2, <clears throat> excuse me, 14 through 16. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they be known, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When we are truly led by the Spirit of God, we will not concern ourselves <clears throat> with those who may have more than we have. If we do, we will rejoice with them for their blessings rather than envy them for their superior wealth. The Spirit will lead us to concern ourselves with those who may have less so that He can use us to be blessings rather than lording our own wealth over them. If we have the mind of Christ, we will be subject only to Him and not allow the enemy to convince us that God is somehow being unfair. If there was ever a fair and just God, He is the one whom we serve. He cares for His people and seeks our welfare. He drew us away from the edge of the eternal cliffs of hell and showed us His love for us when we deserved it the least, when we deserved none of His mercy. Now that we are His, how much more does He care for His own? If He cared for us enough to show us the path that we were taking was leading to eternal destruction and save us in the midst of our sin from eternal damnation, how much more is He going to help us and give us what we need when we're trusting in Him for those things that we need? How much more is he going to help us through the trials that he knows we're going to face as humans? How much more is he going to strengthen us and give us what we need in those times of need in this life when we're looking to him and not allowing the things going on around us to distract us from his will for our lives? <clears throat> How much more should we trust him when we can't be certain of the immediate plans that he has for us. We know the end of his plans. 
We know the eternity that He has intended for us. But we can't be certain of the immediate temporal plans that He has for us. We know the end of His plans, and we know that they are all working together for our good. How could we even begin to mistrust such a good and loving God by calling His actions unfair? I, I just thinking right now, I'm thinking about the, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. <clears throat> they were crying out to Moses, you're, you're doing this wrong, basically. And in fact, even though they thought they were speaking to Moses, their cries were directed toward God. Because any time we cry out to our leaders and, and complain of their behavior, Pastor, you're doing it wrong. I might as well be looking up at God and saying, God, you're doing it wrong. Because God had put that very one in, in position that he's in. We have to be careful when we complain and we say, that's not fair. Because we may be looking at the situation and saying, this situation isn't fair. They have more than I do. They're getting treated better than I do, and I'm doing better than they are. We may be looking at the situation like that, but what we're saying is, God, you're doing this wrong. Anytime we're saying, that's not fair, I want you to get this in your mind because they're the same thing. That's not fair is equivalent to, God, you're doing this wrong. I'm not being treated justly. God, you're doing this wrong. I should have more than I have. God, you're doing this wrong. I should be, I should be better off now than I am. God, you're doing this wrong. Anything that we think is negative in our lives and we think we should be treated better, we're telling God he's doing his job wrong. Who of us? Who of us? has the authority to tell God that he's done something wrong. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't have that authority. I do know exactly about you. None of you have that authority. None of us have the authority to tell God he's doing things wrong. I, I can't believe you, you put this on me, God. You're doing this wrong. God knows the plans that he has for us, and he knows the end of those plans. <clears throat> He may have been disappointed then in the disciples' level of thinking, that is Jesus, as he is now concerning our level of thinking about fairness on many, many occasions. He also knew how unfair and cruel those disciples would soon be treated, and he knew they were not ready for the level of servitude necessary to witness to the world and spread the good news. Following the parable about the vineyard, would it not have been interesting if even one of his disciples had stated, <clears throat> Jesus, those poor fellows that waited all day for a job had to be really stressed. After all, in those days, men who had no wages had no provision for their families. Remember, they're only getting paid by the day. If you didn't, get, if you didn't work today, then you didn't eat today. <clears throat> After all, in those days, men had no wages, had no provision for their families. Those folks who had, to not, who had not found jobs early in the day did not have to endure the sun. Instead, they endured standing around, wringing their hands, thinking there would be no food for their families that night. Now, how many of you, I don't know, I, I know I was there, <clears throat> how many of us laid in bed in our sinful past thinking, Lord, let me wake up in the morning because I'm not ready to go. <laughs> The same, that's where this, this parable has taken us. I'm not ready to go. I don't have the, I don't have the provisions necessary to see my soul into, a, into eternity, and I don't have the willingness to let you do it. That's a terrible place to be. It's a very unpleasant place to be. When we really think about it, <clears throat> the men hired first received the best reward because they had worked all day knowing their families would have food that evening. <clears throat> that is not unlike the picture of Christians who serve God early in life and get to enjoy the benefits of a personal walk with Him throughout life. <laughs> those who, serve, who have begun life serving God, they may never have thought, had those thoughts uh, laying in bed at night thinking, Lord, just let me wake up in the morning because I'm not ready to go. That's a, and like I said, that's an unpleasant thought to have. And those who are saved early in life, 
and, and continued remain saved throughout their lives till this point, praise the Lord. <clears throat> it's difficult to learn fairness like that which God has. God desires that his workers esteem others more highly than themselves. That is why the story follows Matthew 19.30. <coughs> Excuse me. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Each disciple would have his own difficult cross to bear. Jesus wanted to tell a story that would get their attention and our attention even today. We know God is infallible and makes no mistakes about fairness or any other concept, real or unreal. In this parable, not only is this parable not only not all sorry, is this parable not also about an invitation that is continually open to join the workers by following Jesus? Perhaps Jesus told this story to enlighten these disciples on the plans that they were <clears throat> they are only one phase of the workers. There would be other workers becoming engaged in later phases, but they would receive the same reward because Christ had died for all. <clears throat> I'm running out of time. and I got a lot of pages. I'm going to skip ahead here just a little bit. <coughs> Something is wrong. Psalm 73. <clears throat> I just want to read this at least a portion of this psalm. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. What could cause a faithful man of God to come so near to his own destruction? Verse 3 and going on. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. <clears throat> For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression, and they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his his, peop his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, <clears throat> How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. They deny God, yet they flourish. They condemn the weak and the righteous, but they see no distress of their own. They prosper and increase in wealth while clearly defying all that is good and right. In verse 13, and moving move forward. Verily, I've cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. The writer here complains that his own life has been a constant struggle to please the Lord in suffering and in want. He felt the correction from God in this minor offense. He felt the correction. He felt the correction from God in his minor offenses. While others who are wicked and wealthy laughed at him. But even then, he knew that if these thoughts were openly declared... He would not be justified in his good witness, and he would not be justified, and his good witness would be destroyed among God's faithful. Verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors as, in, as a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. When he thought on these things, he was driven to seek God for the answers. And God faithfully supplied for his need. God showed him there 
bitter end. The joy of this life would not follow them to the grave. The writer may suffer temporarily in this life at times, but there would be no end to their eternal torment. Verse 21, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is, my, is, my, is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. As the author of this lesson says, the word translated here as beast could mean hippopotamus. Rather than envy the wealthy wicked, he learned to pity their sad state. In this life, none are so wealthy as the children of God. <clears throat> The sooner we realize this fact, the sooner we can avoid and ignore any and all of the distractions that the enemy of our soul would try to cast into our paths. The richest man in the world without God is miserable and wretched and eternally lost. But the man without a penny to his name and enemies on every side holds wealth beyond compare <clears throat> if he simply trusts God to supply for his each and every need, both in this life and in the one to come. Let's see. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. In other words, however we treat others, we can fully expect God to do the same for us. 1 John 5, 14, 15, And this is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we shall have the petitions that we desire of him. According to his will. That means, in a, uh, <clears throat> that means a lot in this passage of scripture. We can only be assured of receiving the answers we seek if we are asking according to God's will. Therefore, if we're praying and not receiving, we would do well to first seek guidance from God as to how we should appropriately pray in any given situation. It is not God's will to withhold any good thing from His children, but sometimes what we think is good is not actually what we need. This is why it is critical that we're fully submitted to Him. If we are not, we won't even know how to pray as we should in the first place. And then we'll be disappointed and confused when God doesn't answer as we think He should. God, you're doing this wrong. <clears throat> Anytime we have a thought that resembles, that's not fair, we need to understand that we have missed the boat concerning God's will and would do well to quickly receive His understanding of the situation. Like with Asaph, who wrote the 73rd Psalm, God will reveal His truth when we come to Him but we still must be open to receive His truth. If God speaks and we refuse to hear, we cannot rightly blame God for the mess that we get ourselves into. God wants us to succeed. He desires what is best for His children as any loving father would. But we must be willing to hear and obey even when His directions aren't pleasant. All things will work together for our good if we simply trust the only one who knows our future? Anyone know your future? Anyone know even tomorrow? I mean, you can say the things that you expect to happen, but you, can you say with any certainty what's going to happen tomorrow? No. We need to trust the only one who knows for sure exactly what we're going to face any moment of any time of any day. <clears throat> we have eternity to gain for ourselves as well as those who perceive our faithful service to God and desire to do likewise. This isn't only fair it's more than we could ever deserve. Praise the Lord. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm 